We move on to the next section for finding critical values. We look at question 21, and question 21 refers us back to question 17. So in question 17, we have a right tail test with an alpha of 0 0.05. And what it means to find the critical value is since this is a right tail test, the size of our right tail is alpha. And our critical value is the point that cuts it off. In this case, it's going to be a z-score. So we need a z-score that cuts off an upper tail of size 0 0.05. So for my class, when I cover 6.1, I let you know back then that you really want to be gods of these 6.1 types of questions. And that's exactly what this is, is finding a cutoff score. So we could go to Statdis to find this, or we could go to um, our table A2, and their table A2 at the bottom right of the positive values has some common critical values. Or we can go into the table, and if it's 5% to the right, it's going to be Ninety-five percent to the left there, and what we're going to get is a value of one point six four five. Uh, the trouble with using the common critical values is that's really set up for confidence intervals. It's not set up for one-tail tests. Um, so. You want to be careful about that. You want to know what these things are actually telling you. So on the bottom right of the table A2, the common critical values, those are for confidence intervals. Now, on the bright side, when we're running through these problems in their entirety for A2, A3, A4, StatDisk is going to find everything for us. If we go ahead, let Statis know everything that it needs to know, it's going to give us the test statistic, it's going to give us the critical value, it's going to give us the p-value. So we've done part A, we've found the critical value, now they want us to kind of revisit the decision-making process using test statistic versus critical value. In Triola's chart of the process here, he does give us the critical value method to take a look at. And really moving forward, we're gonna be focusing much more on the p-value method, because the nice thing about that is the rule of rejection never changes for the p-value method. It does change for the test statistic versus critical value method, but it's basically reject if you land in the tail. So the rule of rejection written using test statistic and critical value so a rule of rejection is reject null hypothesis if our test statistic, and we would label this thing for whatever it is in context, Z, we're going to 
set that up and compare that to our critical value and how you would go ahead and put the inequality is, well, what does it mean to be off in that tail? And to be off in the right tail, we would have to be greater than that. So we would reject if we land in here. And if we land in there, we need to be greater than that. Now, one of the things that I hope that you notice, well, let's finish this here first. From 17, our test statistic was 1.00. So, you know, right there was our test statistic Z. And our critical value there is also a z-score. This is why they label them other things, so critical value versus test statistics, so we don't confuse the z with the z there. But what we see is that our test statistic didn't land in the tail. And numerically, 1.00 is not greater than 1.645. So here we fail to reject the null hypothesis, which is the exact same result we got in 17. And how these relate to each other, I'm gonna draw another normal distribution here, is There's our significance level, and then our critical value, in this case our critical Z of 1.645, and then our test statistic of Z, which is 1.00, and the tail that this cuts off, the size of that is the P value. So if our test statistic was off in the tail here, we would see that our P value would be smaller. The area under that curve is going to be smaller than our significance level there. And that our test statistic would be greater than our critical value. So one of the things about this and it's like comparing temperatures. If one, you know, if Dowagic is warmer than Chicago when we look at temperature in Fahrenheit, then Dowagic has to be warmer than Chicago when we look at the temperature in Celsius. We should never get a result that contradicts what the other method would have given us here. So we're either going to decide comparing areas under the curve, or we're going to decide comparing numbers on the number line, but both of them need to leave us to the same decision.